Good morning for everyone. And Professor Carolina, Professor Kenneth Williams, uh, our president, Professor Hector Gugolino Souza, and Professor Manuelita, Professor Saulo, Professor Daniel, Professor Neandro. Um, Professor Julio Rocha, uh, we'll start our seminar, um, the second panel on environment and right to health. Okay. And um, with Professor Fadwa El Gyunji from Egypt. Uh, thank you, Professor Fadwa. And she will talk about I can breathe CO2 or policy knee on neck. Pandemic unmasking link, 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 linkages between society, environment, and health. And Professor Father, please, your presentation. And um, Professor Father, uh, she is, uh, she is, um, Hatchery, uh, USLA, is former distinguished professor at Qatar University. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas in Austin. She is elected trustee at the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she is a uh, World Academy of Arts and Sciences fellow too. And professor, if you have a presentation, please share with us and let's start our presentation. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, um, Saulo and the executive committee and um, the World Academy. And uh, thank you, Heron. Um, I can't breathe. And this is the um, title I chose to reveal the connectivity between environment health and society. And uh, there is a, a linkage that got unmasked very uh, clearly and revealed very clearly with the pandemic between society, uh, health, and um, the environment. Now, the, um, the I can't breathe, of course, whether it's by uh, the release of uh, carbon in the environment or the attack uh, by nature on us uh, by COVID-19 or um, the situation of the police knee on the neck of the African-American Floyd that, that became an international movement which uh, revealed societal uh, problems. And um, these problems have already uh, been studied uh, in the past uh, year, and um, a, an important study came out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showing how the um, the relationship between COVID and the disadvantaged uh, uh, populations and society in the United States. We have the uh, Black and Latino populations suffering the most. And um, of course, there are the homeless and the elderly, uh, the elderly all over the world, but the elderly in the United States were uh, the ones who were in uh, the nurseries um, uh, with uh, below standard uh, conditions. Now, the linkages were already made in 1946. The World Health Organization defined health as not being simply the absence of disease, but the totality of the uh, person, the physical, mental, and social well-being. In 1992, the Rio Declaration made the linkage between environment and health, and uh, they declared that um, humans are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature now. Nature gives us good and bad. As we have seen, viruses are organisms from antiquity. And um, whether coming from bat or camel, they will seek humans as ideal hosts. Weakened bodies will nurture them. And failed responses 
at the um, governing or societal levels, make them thrive. Uh, the magnitude can be seen today in how uh, the virus pursues its goal for survival by rapidly changing and by um, transmissibility. Of course, we go to the climate and again, uh, this has been going on for a long time, climate change. There were major migrations between 60,000 and 80,000 years ago uh, when humans, uh, according to the uh, accepted theory, now left Africa for Asia. And then around 45 years ago, another uh, move and then uh, into Australia, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And then 5,000 years ago, different groups were leaving. Of course, uh, these are uh, populations uh, moving driven by either drought or uh, poor uh, food resources uh, um, exacerbated by use. Um, we go to uh, the, the other side of it, the resilience of um, ancient and local ways of food production. Uh, we know that for thousands of years, uh, Latin America, the peoples of Latin America, the Middle East and elsewhere, were very successful in um, domesticating wide grass and making it, um, domesticating it into crops. Now, the uh, experts consider this accomplishment in land breeding very uh, important accomplishment. Then they improved cultivation techniques to enable uh, further production, more production and surpluses. And of course, the ancient Mesoamerica Ancestors cultivated maize, beans, squash, and so on, that supported civilizations, the Olmec, the Maya, the Toltec, the Aztec, the Zapotec, the Mishtec, they all were supported by uh, very successful uh, production. And along with animal proteins, they met the nutritional needs that, that are sufficient to develop very highly complex society. The Zapotec, for instance, over a period of 5,000 years, mastered food production, and this point did not escape the um, colonial conquistadores, like Hernán Cortés wrote to the imperial crown in Spain that these locals are cultivating so well and producing so much that we can, uh, this can accrue great profit to the crown. But also there are corroborating, uh, corroborating uh, contemporary studies revealing the resilience in the ancient methods of agriculture that led to abundance for thousands of years. Now, um, a, a study in a contemporary study, again, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and this uh, particular study is on Peru, uh, showed how uh, it is not just the, that they were able to, um, to cultivate well, but the way they dealt with the landscape in ancient times and for long periods, like 2,000 years, they managed and mitigated threats of floods and environments and so on. Um, now, um, I like the, uh, the comment made by a, uh, a mountain Campesino, who, uh, when visited by uh, agronomists who are experts on coming to see how they farm and whether they can help them. This is in contemporary times now. Um, the Campesino said, mucha teoría en poca práctica. Now, uh, with all the expertise that they came with, uh, the farmers uh, found that they do not understand these experts do not understand the local farming methods or the local soils. However, of course, they succeeded to deliver the uh, ration fertilizer that was allocated to them and the campesinos were happy to receive it. But here I'm not glorifying ancient or local. Is all local or all ancient considered knowledge? We need not dismiss or over romanticize. Instead, it must be carefully determined what is to be considered knowledge to build on in all these systems. And modern technology is a useful tool which our cognitive capacity can creatively deploy to build flexible plans, to minimize damage. And this is what resilience means. Let me take you to an example from um, uh, Qatar in Doha, where I was invited there and I was 
there for 10 years and I was teaching, where you see uh, a situation of a country that moved straight from desert to high technology in a period of under three decades uh, because of the fossil fuel that they discovered that was the major natural uh, resource, uh, which of course put uh, Qatar in a dilemma because they were also faced with working with the United Nations and the world on sustainable development goals. Now, the picture you see to the left is uh, that area in 1982. And as I point here, uh, this section is the same section here in 2012. When I took that picture, you can see what happened uh, within uh, three decades. This is sudden and dramatic, high technology, and when I go to the classroom, my uh, students were wearing the latest watches, were holding the uh, latest um, um, uh, mobiles and the latest computers. And the classroom had such high technology I have never seen in the United States. Now, we go then, are they learning with all of that? And uh, the students come. Uh, they know exactly how to use technology better than me and, and anybody else of my generation. And they would present PowerPoints in the classroom, um, uh, picking images from Wikipedia and the internet, and then putting their own uh, or voice uh, accompanies the presentation with um, memorized statements. If I stop them to ask a question, uh, from a very uh, robotized uh, presentation, I find that they are really not able to uh, engage, and they seem not. They seem to me that they don't understand what they are uh, presenting. So I called the administration and I said, I want the classrooms to be all the technology to be removed from my classrooms. I want a whiteboard and colored chalk. And of course, the administration said, we don't have chalk in Qatar. And I said, well, if you can get your breakfast from Paris, you can get me chalk. Next day, I had chalk. And I changed entirely the way to teach because of the situation in Qatar, where they went straight to technology without the gradual building of knowledge, the gradual building of identity, the gradual building of a worldview that would enable them to receive. It's not only infrastructure, but knowledge. Uh, as example, I'm talking about knowledge and infrastructure. Next door to them, we have ancient Egypt, where um, their identity is woven by uh, worldviews that tells them stability can be achieved if you combine uh, justice, um, life, and governance. And uh, But of course, this kind of stability is throughout um, a generation, the continuity is broken by historical events, by political events. And most recently, uh, the people had uh, in Egypt had two revolutions back to back, one in 2011 and one in 2013, both by what I call free democracy, um, given that the um, political institutions were not uh, active at that time. And they were, in, to the left here, they were asking for Mubarak to be removed, the president. And to the right, they were asking for Morsi to be removed as president. There were about 30 million in the streets of Egypt. Now, Five minutes, uh, please. They, this is a kind of a chaos that's produced. But then uh, Egypt has, since 2013, uh, started to um, revive itself build new institutions of democracy with uh, checks and balances and bring in technology and build roads and so on. So the point here is you have to take the historical moment of a uh, country when we're talking. Um, we were um, faced with a, uh, a um, virus and as you see all these variants and some variants uh, cause the infection and some variants um, okay, uh, uh, defy um, the um, uh, in, in unity, <coughs> rapidly, constantly changing, aggressively transmissible, evading immune systems, 
So nature programs organisms to survive and multiply, but nature also gave humans more cognitive capacity for flexibility and creativity. Creative resilience is fighting programmed resilience. So what have we learned very fast in conclusion? We cannot disinvite those mutating guests, but we can use this experience and our unique cognitive capacity to build resilience with creative flexibility, improve national institutions, strengthen science, cooperate and communicate globally, bring justice into our societies, bring peace into our cross-national relations, consider uniqueness of certain countries and their phase of development. We might, this way, succeed to make these persistent guests uncomfortable enough to cut short their visit. Thank you. Congratulations, Professor Fadwa from Egypt and information, the great culture of Egypt. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, retired from uh, University of California, Los Angeles. And next, we will, I would like to introduce to you Professor Jeanette Viga Morales uh, from Chile. She'll talk about the a brave new world health after pandemic. Professor Janet Vega, and thank you so much, Professor Janet Vega, and you can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. First of all, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm very honored to be here uh, with all of you, and I wanted to talk to about uh, what is going on from the health perspective in the uh, pandemic and also what is probably going to happen in the future of the world. So I, I, I named the presentation A Brave New World, what is going to happen after the pandemic. So perhaps the first thing is just to put a, a bit of context. We are having uh, at the moment uh, more than 160 million cases and more than 3 million deaths. And uh, uh, we only have administered uh, 1 million and, and 400 doses of vaccines. So we are very far from achieving the coverage that we need. And the graph shows the situation in the last um, uh, month. And uh, you see here the very worrisome situation what it, that is happening in India, even though we have some uh, preliminary figures that perhaps the peak is, 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 is over and that we are beginning to see a decrease in cases. Um, now, what has been the impact of COVID-19? Well, first of all, uh, we know that there are uh, direct impact and also indirect impacts and long, short and long-term impact. And of course, the first impact that we have all seen is the the very uh, uh, great increase in morbidity and mortality due to COVID-19. But at the same time, we have had other impacts. For example, the great interrupt uh, on care for other chronic and, and, and urgent health conditions we are going to have an extremely high load to solve after the epidemic is over. We also have had a lot of uh, uh, preventable mortality that is going on around the world. Now, in addition to that, we are having huge impacts on so social and economic impacts and also a lot of impacts in the mental health of our populations. So this is an example. This is a couple, I mean, some selected countries where you can see what has been the excess mortality in the, in the Latin America mostly. Uh, and in almost all countries, there had been uh, a lot of mortality due to things that haven't been able to be prevented or treated. And in addition to the mortality due to COVID-19. 
We also have had all over the world an excess mortality in maternal and less than five year old. Uh, and that has been uh, um, affecting almost all countries in the world, including high income and medium income level countries. Regarding the economic impact, and I'm showing this, the impact of the pandemic and the Caribbean, and in fact, the summary of it is that it has been the most uh, uh, important impact on the economy since World War II. And uh, globally also, the, the, uh, the GDP has uh, decreased in almost in more than 5%. So we are having a huge uh, impact and the, the process for recovering doesn't look very promising as we speak. Also, another very important social impact has been on education. And that is the number of uh, students that uh, are uh, have been without education uh, and you see that we are talking about billions of students that haven't been able to continue their education due to the pandemic. In addition to that in Latin America we have had a huge increase in unemployment uh, up to 3.4 percentage uh, and we have increased from 8.1 to 11 in 2020, and the number of poor people in the region has increased by almost 30 million, which is very important. Now, one of the things that has been discussed, and we are all probably have been uh, uh, subjected to, uh, to that, is what has been the response of the authorities and also the global response. And uh, as a summary, I'm summarizing the results of the, some of the independent panels that have recently released their reports or that have, uh, go, are going to present their reports in the World Health Assembly. Uh, in fact, so far we have uh, spent more than $11 billion in response to which we can add loss of benefit for $10 billion. Uh, the annual cost of pandemic preparedness is, is around one, $5 per capita. So uh, the estimated cost of the pandemic over the next years, uh, we're talking about trillions of dollars. And the money spent so far by the world could be enough to invest in preparedness measures for 500 years. So five-year prevention and preparedness expenditures are measured in billions and the cost of the pandemic so far run into the trillions of dollars. Now the global, what, ha, what the pandemic has also shown us that the global architecture for preparedness and response is completely fragmented, disorganized and uncoordinated, which has led to uh, a collective failure and that's the summary. The global response to COVID-19 has been a collective failure in prevention, preparation, response, and prior prioritization of actions. But in addition to that, a colossal failure in terms of global and country governance. We know that the world cannot be, afford to be unprepared again, that the return of investment for global health security is immense, and the countries that have successfully fight the disease has shown us that political leadership does make the difference. There has been lack of transparency and accountability by global and country leaders, which has deep, deepened the trust of the populations. And we have uh, painfully uh, learned that outbreaks begin and end in communities, so communities need to be involved. And we also know that no one is safe until we are all safe. So we need, in fact, an international framework for health emergency preparedness and response that perhaps can replace existing fragmentations. What is the future now? Well, the challenge is to rehearse the future and prepare for a range of possibilities. And if we imagine the world in a couple of years from now, uh, there has some things that have changed that will probably uh, 
stay with us. First of all, the social distancing is going to be manifesting in different form, and that will be part of our life. That will be the new way that humans interact. We are in a society that is becoming much more socially contactless. The daily life uh, will probably uh, become uh, much more uh, digital, and that could be a good thing. The elite, uh, uh, we are basically having two different worlds unfolding with a small elite completely disconnected and the rest of us that are basically struggling with uh, coping with the new global architecture. At the same time, it's going to be a bipolar response, a very hyper-connected world, but on the other hand, all of us are increasingly using local services from supermarkets to help. A huge distortion on how young generations shape their life and how they perceive the, the world and also a danger of a societal surveillance state, which has happened in some countries. So we basically, if we have to summarize, we could say that we, we will have to manage the uncertainty in, in three uh, time horizons. First of all, uh, at the short term, what is going to be our quick actions in particular to secure that we can recover from the epidemic? Next, what are we going to, to do to look for new opportunities? And then how are we going to transform in particular our health system to better respond? And in, in, to do that, we need to think that we need to probably reshape the way we, we work when we have pandemics. We need to make sure that we recover from the impact of health. We need to make sure that we put in place measures to recover from the economic impact. And also we need to change the way that we govern our global architecture. We need to advance towards health in all policies for real, a new model of resilient health. And then of course, uh, we, we have uh, painfully learned that health, it is in fact at the center of the development agenda which means that we need to learn how to really work together from the different sectors, including education and labor, Five sustainable minutes. development and security. If we really want to change uh, the way that uh, we uh, uh, cope with this type of catastrophes. So that is what I wanted to share with you and uh, the rest can go uh, for the discussion. In summary, I would say that we are confronting a crisis of unprecedented uh, extent that we should be learning, hopefully, from this crisis that the world has changed and there is a pre-pandemic world and an after-pandemic world and that we need to get ready to make the best of the world that is uh, upcoming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Janeti Viga, for your presentation. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce you, Professor Kenneth Williams. Uh, he is professor at the uh, South Texas University School School in Houston, United States. And he'll talk about uh, Black people and COVID-19 in the uh, USA. And Professor Kenneth Williams is, how I told you uh, before, he is a um, graduate at the University of Virginia School of Law and professor at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Uh, where he teaches criminal law and procedure, evidence, capital punishment, international, international human rights, and international criminal law. And in addition, he is teaching responsibilities. Um, Professor Williams is also a national expert in capital punishment. Professor Kenneth Williams, thank you so much to accept our invitation. And please, you can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. So I'm gonna talk about um, 
the situation with respect to uh, African Americans and Black people uh, in the United States and other uh, minorities, uh, and how COVID-19 has really had a disproportionate impact on the African American and other minority uh, communities. So I want to start off with an um, article that provoked quite a bit of uh, discussion here in the United States. Uh, it appeared in our leading uh, newspaper, the New York Times. And the question the columnist uh, posed was, uh, is America a racist uh, country? And uh, throughout the article, he talks about the history of the United States. It's undeniable that given the history of the United States, we clearly were a racist uh, country. But he points out though, that uh, the racism in fact uh, continues to this uh, day um, he talks about uh, the fact that America is not the same country it was, but neither is it the country it purports to be. On some level, this is a tension between American idealism and American realism, between an aspiration and a current uh, condition. And the pre precise way we phrase the statement makes all the difference. America's systems, like its criminal justice, education, and medical systems, have a pro-white, anti-Black bias and an extraordinary portion of America denies or defend those uh, biases, okay? And so um, he is correct in that uh, America continues to be a racist uh, country and that has played itself out and how um, COVID-19 has impacted uh, the United States and also how it's impacted uh, black people. So just to give you a little uh, context, which already been uh, discussed, but I'll go through it uh, very quickly. Um, Countries with the most uh, COVID cases, of course, United States, Brazil, India, Russia, uh, France, uh, we have the most uh, cases. We also have the most uh, deaths in the United States, uh, COVID uh, deaths and uh, cases. Okay, in terms of race, black people are second. 62 uh, black people per 10,000 have uh, been uh, infected by the coronavirus and uh, Latinos actually have a higher uh, number and I'm gonna get into some of the reasons uh, later uh, for this. And of course, whites uh, is much uh, lower, the uh, number of uh, cases involving uh, white Americans. Uh, COVID now is the number one cause of death in the United States. It eclipses uh, heart disease, uh, diabetes, everything else. Uh, it is the number one uh, cause of death. Now, um, in terms of uh, the cases by race, let's talk about uh, that and COVID by uh, race, okay. Um, as you can see, uh, African Americans have died at a much higher rate of uh, COVID-19 than other uh, races. Uh, so uh, many more uh, African Americans have died than other um, uh, than whites and even other uh, minorities. Uh, so the death rate is much uh, higher for Black Americans than it is for other uh, Americans. Uh, and that's not really surprising given uh, some of the information I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, next. Okay, so why is that? Why do we have so many uh, black people dying of uh, COVID? Uh, well, one reason is that uh, they're more likely to have what's called comorbidities, uh, conditions that would make them more susceptible to dying of uh, COVID-19. So uh, African-Americans have a high rate of diabetes, uh, as you can see here. Uh, United States has a high rate in general of diabetes and African-Americans have an even higher rate of uh, diabetes than, any, than most other, uh, or some, than uh, certainly uh, whites. There's a high rate of uh, diabetes and other uh, minorities also. Uh, high blood pressure is another uh, cause of, um, of uh, COVID-19 uh, deaths. And African-Americans have a high rate of um, also of uh, high blood pressure. And then obesity is another reason why so many uh, black people have uh, died from, uh, it's, it's a big cause of uh, deaths from uh, COVID. And the United States is, uh, has a high rate of obesity and also African-Americans have the highest rate of obesity uh, in the United States. So what has caused this, um, these comorbidities to be more prevalent in the black community and uh, what has caused more black people to die from uh, COVID? Well, I would submit that it's been structural racism uh, that has caused these uh, high numbers of uh, deaths in the black uh, community. Structural racism is basically where you have laws that have been enacted, which end up uh, dis uh, disadvantaging uh, black people and people of color and advantaging uh, white people. So let me go through just a few uh, examples. 
where structural racism has really caused the, uh, is the main uh, reason for the uh, disparities in both uh, cases and deaths and comorbidities, okay? There's been, uh, because of structural racism, there's been a disparity in exposure. African-Americans are more likely to work in what, what we term essential jobs, okay? So these tend to be low wage uh, jobs, home healthcare workers, uh, waiters, uh, Uber drivers, people who are exposed to the public, okay? Uh, they don't really have any opportunity for social uh, distancing. Uh, these tend to be very low wage uh, jobs also. Um, for instance, uh, home healthcare workers. Two thirds of home healthcare workers in the United States are women of uh, color. One in five live uh, below uh, the poverty line. So uh, these are people who tend to um, more likely to be exposed because of the fact that um, they are working in these types of uh, jobs where they simply cannot uh, socially uh, distance. Now, uh, these jobs also, uh, they're exempted from, uh, generally from uh, requiring sick leave and also overtime. And so because these workers are poor and many live at or below the poverty line, they don't get sick leave, so they have to work. Even when they're sick, they have to show up for uh, work, okay? And so obviously that puts them more at risk and also puts at risk, of course, people they come into uh, contact with. Uh, so they can't afford to take off from uh, work. You know, there was a big um, discussion when uh, COVID-19 uh, started about a year ago that people should socially distance, people should stay home. You know, uh, one of the things people uh, pointed out was that uh, we had all these uh, professors from, you know, Yale and uh, University of Michigan and Stanford going on television, uh, imploring people uh, to stay home. Well, a lot of these workers can't, couldn't afford to stay home. Uh, they didn't have the luxury of uh, doing that. Even Congress got into the act to try to assist people uh, who were infected by uh, COVID, both uh, individuals and uh, businesses. The, our Congress call, passed what's called the CARES Act, okay, uh, which basically provided payments to businesses and to individuals uh, to help them manage the, uh, you know, the loss of employment or employment opportunities, the loss of business during uh, COVID. However, the CARES Act uh, exempted essential workers Okay, so these people, um, and they, the Congress said they were exempting essential workers because they were quote unquote essential. Okay, they were concerned that if they were included in the CARES Act, then they would end up uh, taking off from work. And obviously we wouldn't have people at grocery stores and we wouldn't have people working uh, home healthcare workers. We wouldn't have people cleaning up uh, the streets and picking up the uh, trash. Okay, so um, because of this structural racism that's built into the system, they're more likely to be exposed to uh, uh, COVID-19. And also um, in terms of uh, structural racism has uh, also caused a disparity in susceptibility to COVID-19. Um, so an example of structural racism and how it has made uh, black people more susceptible. We talked about all the COVID, all the uh, comorbidities for uh, COVID. Well, how did those come about? Okay. Those basically came about because of a practice, government practice called uh, laws called uh, redlining. The government, uh, federal government in 1930s passed the uh, Federal Home Administration Act, which basically provided subsidies for home building as long as they didn't sell to black people. Okay. So government was basically subsidizing home building as long as they didn't sell the uh, homes to black people. So what resulted from that? A practice called redlining. Okay, so basically what developers would do, they would draw red lines around black communities. And so they would not build in those communities. So what redlining caused was racial segregation, housing segregation. So basically in the United States, we still to this day, neighborhoods are segregated for the most part by our race. Black people will live with black people, white people live with uh, white people, Latinos live with uh, Latinos. So this redlining practice, even though obviously it's been outlawed, we're still living with the uh, impact and the effects of those uh, practices. Okay, so what is the impact of um, having uh, segregated uh, neighborhoods by race? Well, black neighborhoods for one tend to be food, what we call quote unquote food deserts. What does that mean? It means that uh, those neighborhoods tend not to have supermarkets that sell fresh uh, food, that sell uh, fresh meats and fresh fruits and healthier uh, food. Okay, there was a story in the Houston Chronicle just yesterday on this uh, topic. And in Houston, 500,000 uh, black people live in neighborhoods where there is no grocery store. Okay, 
So what happens in these neighborhoods? A lot of times they don't have uh, transportation either. So what do they have to do? There are a lot of convenience stores in these uh, neighborhoods, fast food places. So what they end up doing is they end up eating at uh, these uh, fast food and convenience uh, places. They end up eating, you know, stuff like hot dogs and um, Coca-Cola and uh, things that are just generally not uh, healthy. So what happens when you eat this kind of uh, food? Well, what happens when you eat this kind of food? You're not eating healthy food. You're eating, eating high sodium, high fat of uh, uh, types of uh, high sugary uh, food. You develop high rates of obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure. So that's basically where those comorbidities derive from, the structural racism that derive from the redlining uh, practice. So we have white neighborhoods where grocery stores and supermarkets markets are plentiful. There are all kinds of uh, health food stores and uh, supermarkets, but those tend not to be the case in black neighborhoods throughout the United States, okay? Um, also black neighborhoods tend to have high rates of uh, pollution. Uh, which uh, of course causes asthma, which is also a condition that's problematic with respect to uh, COVID-19. Okay, a lot of black people live in uh, neighborhoods where uh, the houses don't have proper uh, plumbing uh, facilities. Because one of the things we learned from uh, COVID-19 is that um, you are supposed to wash yourself, your hands uh, constantly. Uh, you're supposed to uh, wash your body to prevent uh, COVID. Well, a lot of black people didn't have that uh, option because they uh, may not have adequate uh, plumbing uh, facilities to uh, do that. And also uh, black people and minorities in general in the United States tend to live in close uh, quarters. You tend to have more intergenerational uh, families living together. And so that of course, the more uh, closely you live with uh, and exposed to other people where you can't socially distance, uh, that's more likely to make you susceptible to uh, COVID-19. So structural racism has made uh, black people more susceptible to uh, being, uh, 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 being uh, inflicted with uh, COVID-19. And then uh, finally, structural racism has caused disparities in treatment in terms of medical uh, treatment. Uh, many black neighborhoods don't have hospitals. Okay? They don't really have hospitals due to government uh, policies. Government put uh, hospitals, public hospitals and private hospitals were geared toward white uh, neighborhoods and not uh, black uh, neighborhoods. So they tend not to have um, uh, hospitals. They tend to have much lower uh, uh, performing uh, clinics in black uh, neighborhoods. And co of course that has an impact on uh, health. Um, there are also, there have been studies, many uh, studies over the years, which have shown that uh, African-Americans receive poor uh, treatment from health uh, professionals and uh, doctors. Uh, they tend not to receive the same quality of care. Certain life-saving uh, uh, therapies and medicines are not uh, necessarily um, given to uh, uh, with help from uh, Black people. So uh, that's been a real uh, problem. The structural racism has basically caused the disparity in the United States with respect to uh, who gets uh, COVID and who dies from uh, COVID. So uh, that's a big reason why uh, African Americans have been uh, primarily uh, the victim or disproportionately the victims of um, COVID-19. Of course, we have the uh, vaccine. The United States is one of the leading countries in the world. In terms of administering uh, the vaccine, I think I saw uh, yesterday that we've administered the vaccine fully to about 40% of the uh, population. I think it's over 50%, I think it's 65% I saw, have received at least uh, one uh, dose, okay? So um, we have been very good. We were not very good, as uh, the professors uh, pointed out earlier, we're not very good at managing uh, COVID-19 and uh, our policies. Uh, many people died who sh should not have uh, died, but we have been very good at administering uh, the uh, vaccine. Okay, uh, we have uh, several vaccines that have been uh, approved. Here in the United States now, vaccines are widely available. Um, for the most part, <clears throat> don't even need an appointment. Uh, to get a vaccine now. You can just walk into a clinic or walk into a site and get a uh, vaccine. In fact, one of the uh, challenges now the government uh, is facing is actually encouraging people to get uh, the vaccine. And some of the people they have to uh, encourage are Black people to get uh, the vaccine, okay? And uh, Black people have basically been um, receiving the vaccine at uh, much uh, disproportionately uh, low uh, rates. They have not been receiving the vaccine at the same rate as uh, whites. And I have a, uh, I wanted to show right quick uh, an example of that. Okay, let's see here. Uh, 
three minutes. Okay, okay, sure, okay. Um, okay, yeah, here you go. So um, in terms of the vaccine, there's been a lot of hesitancy in general in the United States uh, to the uh, vaccine by some populations. And it's especially been uh, the case with African-American um, population. So in every state, the percentage of uh, individuals receiving the vaccine is less than the actual African-American percentage of the population. So the percentage of African-Americans being vaccinated and less, is less than their percentage of the uh, population. So I'll just go through a few examples. In Alabama, for instance, uh, Alabama uh, Black people are 27% of the population. They have been 24% of the uh, vaccinations. They've been 29%, it's so a high percentage of the uh, deaths than a percentage of the population, 28% of the uh, cases. So fewer Black people are being um, uh, vaccinated is uh, really every uh, state. Uh, District of Columbia, the capital, which has a large uh, Black uh, population, 46% of the uh, city, some people try to make it a state, um, uh, are, are, of the residents are African-American. Uh, but only 31% of those have been uh, vaccinated, whereas they have been 70% of the uh, COVID-19 deaths in uh, the District of uh, Columbia. Uh, same in uh, Florida, twice as many uh, people, uh, Black people are 16% of the uh, population of uh, Florida, but only half of that, 8% uh, of the uh, vaccinations have gone to African Americans. And I can go on and on about uh, that. My state, for instance, here in uh, Texas, African Americans are 12% of the population have been only 8% of the uh, vaccinations that have been uh, doled out so far. So, uh, and that's a recurrent uh, pattern, like I said, throughout um, the uh, United States. So that vaccine hesitancy is especially uh, problematic in the uh, black uh, community, in the African-American uh, community, and there are reasons for that. And so let's talk about some of the reasons for that. Well, one uh, reason is that African-Americans tend not to be as, have as the same computer access and internet uh, access, okay? And initially, uh, one had to be pretty savvy to make an appointment. All the appointments were basically done online. Uh, and so you had to have a computer, you had to have, have, to have, have been computer uh, savvy in order to even schedule uh, an appointment. We talked about the fact that African-Americans are the work schedules. Uh, tend to, uh, they work in quote unquote essential uh, jobs. Then I, their work schedules aren't flexible enough to get uh, the, allow them to uh, get the uh, vaccine. Okay, and then um, transportation issues. A lot of black people have uh, transportation uh, issues. And then we talked about the discrimination uh, in the, uh, by medical professionals. So there's a real distrust in the United States among the African-American uh, population. But one of the main reasons for the uh, distrust is what's called the Tuskegee uh, study which occurred in 19, from 1932 to 1972. It was a study done by the U United States Public uh, Service, Health Service, okay? And this was the uh, ad that they put out offering, uh, they were recruiting um, uh, black, uh, they called them Negro uh, males uh, back then, okay? And basically the gist of it is that- Time is over. Okay. Time is over. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, but the hesitancy results from this Tuskegee uh, experiment uh, where black people basically were not given treatments for syphilis when in fact treatments were available. And uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and uh, stop and then I'll take any questions uh, later about that. Thank you so much, Professor Kenneth William. I know that you have a lot of information for us. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation from Houston, Texas. And Professor Kenneth William, he is a friend of Brazil and it's a pleasure, it's an honor to receive you, Professor Kennedy. And I would like to introduce you and uh, I'd like uh, uh, to sympathize with um, and more than one billion of family who deaf people. Yeah, a lot of people die in, around the world. So uh, I would like to sympathize with this family first. And I would like to introduce you to Professor Carolina Leiva um, from Chile. She will talk about uh, uh, animals in dignity, a critical analysis. Professor Carolina Leiva is a lawyer, 
Master in Animal Law and Society at the Autonomous uh, Universidade Autonoma de Barcelona, PhD in Law candidate at the University of Chile and the uh, uh, Universidade Autonoma de Barcelona, uh, public uh, policy and and public and legislative advisor, lecturer, author, and researcher, and PhD scholar fellow at the National Research of Development Agency Government of Chile. And please, Professor Carolina Leiva, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you very much, everyone. You hear me? Uh, yes? Perfect. Yes, okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, my presentation has uh, not quite uh, to do exactly with the topics that have been very importantly be shown in this uh, in this uh, seminar and especially in this part of the seminar. But if you think that maybe our relationship with animals or with nature in general uh, can be seen in a different way after all the situation of COVID and all the shows about uh, human rights, all the all what has been shown uh, about the unaccomplished of human rights are along the world, it, it is it, it invites uh, to our reflection. Well, my presentation, as Professor said, it's called about it's called animals animals and dignity a critical analysis, and uh, it explores from a critical perspective the usefulness and and pertinence of introducing the notion of dignity into the animal question. To this end, I explore the understanding of the concept of dignity as one that is status conferring and analyze the different positions that for and against are raised before uh, a possible ascription or recognition of dignity to animals. In different fields, the term dignity has always been considered as a notion that it's status conferring, both in a moral and in a legal sense. In strict legal terms, the concept of dignity has been found legal positive sanction in various instruments, particularly in the field of human rights, both at national and supranational level, having also achieved exceptionally legal recognition in the field of animal protection, for instance, in the constitution of Swiss. The importance of the notion of dignity in the topic of subjectivity has been, uh, has been its understanding as a necessary precondition for moral patience, especially as a quality that belongs to a given entity to be the possessor of a value in itself, while at the same time it is an end in itself, which would imply the possibility of using the entity as mere means for the fulfillment uh, of the ends of the others the contrary. <laughs> While many have argued in favor of using the notion of dignity in order to promote or improve uh, or to promote an improvement in the moral uh, and legal status of animals, nevertheless there are some have shown the limitations that that possibility of predicating dignity with respect to entities other than human persons would exhibit. This is because historically, however, is whoever is in possession of dignity is in a superior position with respect to the whoever is not. And the concept carries an important normative burden of duties to be observed in favor of the dignity, dignified subject. The secularized notion of dignity reached its pinnacle as a cornerstone of Western thought through Kant's notion of dignity. Indeed, can use the notion of dignity qua quality as an entity to be an end in itself, as the central axis of aesthetics. Only persons have dignity, which makes them an end in himself, as opposed to things which, why there are no, with it, why there is no impediment to treat them as mere means. This affirms the idea, which is still deeply rooted in Western philosophy today that only people have dignity, while things in turn have only a price. According to this, only human persons will exhibit the capacity to be holders of rights and duties, both in the moral and in the legal sense, since the necessary precondition for this will be the possession of dignity. 
So considering all this, it is not difficult to see the reasons why those who advocate for animal rights are inclined to use the term of dignity on the matter. Two, two possible reasons could be advanced here. Firstly, because the understanding of the animal as an end in itself or as endowed with intrinsic value will make it possible to establish a new normative range of direct duties to animals, as well as limitations on their use. Secondly, animal dignity could operate as a recognition or of subjectivity and therefore would allow the ascription of subjective rights in the Kantian sense as a necessary precondition. However, the extrapolation of the term to the animal question is not only not peaceful for those who consider it to belong exclusively to human persons as superiors to the rest of the, speci the species or uh, and the only one capable of being a subject of and holder of rights and duties. But neither is it is peaceful for those who advocate for the recognition of animal subjectivity. Thus, within the propositions that promotes animal dignity, it is possible even to recognize different positions. Firstly, one can find a, a position that is directly seduced by the idea of animal dignity. Secondly, one can find a position that it's while it's favoring to the use of the notion of animal dignity, does it so with some reservations or hesitations? And thirdly, uh, there is a position that rejects the idea of animal dignity as rough and of, on, and, of a and of a little use. And finally, a position that rejects the idea warning on the dangers that the use of the concept of dignity in the animal question could entail for the good health of human rights. The first of these positions uh, in favor of animal dignity as a tool for statutory promotion, uh, they are so because they see it as a plausible option, but, as, but also as a good one, since it considered to be the way to access to subjectivity and to the descriptions of rights. Christine Korsgaard, for instance, a Kantian philosopher, argues that the recognition of animals as ends in themselves as the way to enable them to become subjects of rights, at least she points out, at holders of a right against mistreatment, against mistreatment as far as uh, penal protection is concerned. And she favors this through a distinction between two senses in which the Kantian notion could be understood. The first one is, uh, well, these two senses are uh, the passive one and the active one. And uh, she considers that the factibility that animals could be ending themselves on the passive sense. The, and she bases this possibility in the capacity of sentience that animals exhibit. Prieto, a Chilean professor, understands dignity as a legal status and favors the idea of attributing such a status to animals in order to reinforce their protection because legal statuses imply continuous demand on society, a demand that the status and its incidents be maintained and protected by law, which is why the notion of dignity will function in itself as a status, moral and legal, uh, in a moral and a legal sense of a high rank, distinguishing between human dignity, which rests on the moral autonomy on the human person, and animal dignity, which rests, rests on their quality as sentient beings. She suggests the coexistence of both statuses in a relationship of equal, both within and between them, animals and persons. But for authors like uh, Bollinger from Switzerland, the, the legal recognition of animal dignity implies recognizing that animals exist exist for their own purposes and not for the ones that humans have and that they possesses an essential value of their own, a value that can be benefited or affected by human action. In a second place, it's possible to find positions in favor of animal dignity, but that has uh, recognized certain difficulties on it uh, if it's not done without taking into account the special difference of each species and the real social possibilities of assuming the consequences of such declarations. For instance, Chauvet from France 
uh, favors the notion of animal dignity insofar as he assumes that the recognition of dignity will provide the respect of interests, but he questions whether indeed of all animals will interests will have the same level and strength when put in relation to the interests of humans. He adds a second problem to this questioning, which relates to the weight of dignity measured between different species. He questions, do lions, cows, and dogs have the same le level of protection of interests? He exemplifies this with the actual differences that exist between animals consumed by humans for food and those that fulfill social or companion roles. Will dogs have a higher degree of dignity than cows in that the fundamental interest of the right to life will be respected from the former but not from the latter? If the answer is yes, does it follow that companion animals enjoy dignity on a pair with humans? To clear this, he distinguishes two levels of understanding of the protection of interest deriving from the recognition of dignity. The first level relates to the extent of the protection, while the second relates to the intensity of this protection. While all entities recognized as dignified will enjoy the same extent of protection, the intensity of the protection of their interests will not be the same for all. For instance, in the case of the protection of life, it, it is easy to appreciate an absolute intensity in the case of human beings, a lower one in the case of dogs, and an already much lower in the case of cows, despite the fact that the protection extends to the life of all of them. The author qualifies this difference. Five minutes. Absolutely. In third place, we found those positions that reject the idea of animal dignity, both because they consider it to be unfounded or because, they, uh, or because of its lack of adaptation to the reality of animals on their needs, questioning in some cases the very idea of dignity in general terms. For instance, James Rachels argues that Darwinism has definitely undermined the very idea of human dignity that has imposed the cent for centuries that human life is to be considered sacred or at least as, uh, of a special importance and that non-human animals would never achieve the same level or moral protection. Does this mean then that embracing evolutionary theory will necessarily mean abandoning the idea of human dignity? He says that not necessarily, but nevertheless, Darwinian theory provides sufficient reason to doubt the truths that support and ground the notion of dignity because, in his opinion, it will become sufficiently suspicious to continue to be upheld the revealed fact that animals would indeed be sentient beings capable of experiencing pain and suffering, endowing with emotions, and moreover, in many cases, endowed with rationality, the latter differing from human rationality only in a matter of degree. Pietrovsky, in his work uh, titled, entitled Against Dignity, argues in favor of surpassing the concept of dignity as a necessary precondition for animal subjectivity, favoring the use of the concept of science, science in its place. He argues that the concept of dignity will be an extremely vague one and deprived of any uh, scientific support. As I have no more, uh, no, not too much time, I will go faster and I will uh, jump some parts. But finally, uh, the, the last group of positions are against uh, the ones that think that uh, the animal dignity, it's not a good idea because of the danger that that represents for human rights. As Habermas has pointed, the concept of human dignity is one of the most important elements in the development of human rights. Moreover, it is the source from which basic human rights derive, and it is the key to the indivisibility to the different generations of rights. In so, there is a conceptual link between dignity and human rights. Having this in mind, uh, some authors warn that the, that the assimilation of animals with humans presents the danger of demeaning the latter, which would pose a risk to their integrity and rights and preservation of human needs humanist and democratic values. There are several authors also here, but in conclusion, all this suggests that there could be good reasons to subtract the notion of dignity from the animal question. 
The incorporation of the concept of dignity into the animal issue does not seem to be as good as it might appear. And in the short, medium and long term, it exhibits no little um, uh, help for the matter. At first, the introduction of animal dignity will face resistance from a large part of moral philosophy uh, and law, with which will question the expansion of a concept that seems inherent to human beings and which has allowed it to be leveled out, and at least ideally, the situation of each or, or um, every human being. At the second stage, the difficulties will be due to the fact to the, uh, that the vagueness on the, of the concept does not really seem to contribute to a better understanding of animal subjectivity, which is why the determination and application of other properties uh, possible capable of conferring status will seem to be more advisable. This will be the case in example of the capacity uh, of scientists, which is- uh, which Time has is over. Scientific value. Finally, it is possible to suggest that the eventual danger in need could, rep could be represented by uh, for could represent for human rights, for equality before the law, and for the basic principles of the rule of law. Will make it advisable to abstain from the idea of animal dignity, especially when nowadays human rights seems to have lost the vigor and the good health that they enjoyed, at least in the abstract terms, until a few years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Carolina Leiva um, from Chile. And it's important to talk about the animals because the animals uh, is in the source of this pandemic here. The destruction of the uh, forest and the natural habitat of these animals and start this kind of pandemic. Here. And unfortunately, we'll face uh, much more about this problem. And thank you so much, Professor. And I would like to introduce you to Professor uh, Manolita Hermes Filia from Brazil. She will talk about Brazil, pandemic and rights to health and, and federalism. And Professor uh, Manolita Hermes, and she is she is a federal state attorney in Brazil, currently on um, second month of a judicial clerk in the Brazilian Federal Supreme Court. And she's PhD, candidate in law at the Universita degli Studi di Roma, Toa Vergata, uh, hold a master in contemporary, uh, contemporary legal system, Universita degli Studi di Roma, Toa Vergata, and has specialized in constitutional, constitutional justice, Universidade de Pisa, and in state law, Universidade Federal da Bahia. And thank you for accepting our invitation, Professor Manolita Hermes, and, and please start your presentation. Thank you, Professor Ron. I have shared my PowerPoint presentation here. First of all, I'd like to say, okay, great. First of all, I'd like to say many thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to this brilliant event. It's really a great honor for me being here. Thank you very much. My presentation is a preliminary uh, outcome from a paper that I'm writing about the pandemic and the, and the federalism here in Brazil. Let's change to the next slide here. So after one year uh, from the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 virus pandemic, the COVID-19, it is possible to carry out some reflections on the relationship between powers in the Brazilian legal framework, uh, in particular on the relations between the federal union and the other federal levels. There is the state members, the federal district, and the municipalities. So some reflections on the actions and also inaction taken to adopt public policies, the country can point out that the historical centralizing dynamics started to be weakened through the judicial interpretation of the competence established by the federal constitution. So uh, uh, briefly, it's worth mentioning the Latin American context. Uh, in many of the Latin American states, the health crisis 
uh, roles in the midst of the political, economic, and social crisis. So the pandemic crisis emphasizes the strong social inequality and extreme poverty, and on the other side, exposes the great wealth accumulated in the hands of few. So uh, in Brazil, the federal constitution specifically dictates an emergency rule. However, the federal government did not resort to the exceptional constitutional provisions. So therefore to deal with the pandemic, each branch had to act in order to provide measures such as specific status, constitutional amendments, coordination of public policies, and also the judicial review. The three brands needed to pave the way of facing the pandemic and its socioeconomic effects. Nonetheless, the effects of the pandemic were felt both in the separation of powers and in the vertical plan of the federation. Here, the presidentialism was established in Brazil through the Constitution of the United States of Brazil of 1891, 130 years ago, with a strong influence for the United States Constitution. So that Constitution also established the federal state here in the judicial review as we consider it nowadays. Later now, the federal Constitution of 1988, the current one, was the result of a constituent uh, assembly and uh, uh, it provides a, a great support for the product, protection of human rights, especially social rights as a right to health. Furthermore, the division of competence and powers is enshrined in the constitution. It provides the division of competence between the federal center and the other federal units, member states, federal district, and municipalities. So the new charter established a constitutional architecture for cooperative federalism in the country. The health is a shared competence between the three levels of the Brazilian Federation. There is a competent, a competent legislative competence shared by union states and federal district regarding the defense of health. On the other hand, there is the constitutional common competence of the union states, federal district, and municipalities to take care of health. So the president, the state governors, and the mayors may act in, act, in, may act in order to establish measures to protect the health. And also, each legislative branch has federative competence. So the federal union has the competence to enact general status, general norms. On the other hand, states, federal districts, and municipalities have competence to enact its specific status related to the local conditions. And the same division of competence uh, 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 is applied to the administrative orders also. So in sum, this was the core tension between uh, uh, the, the entities, federal entities during the first days of the pandemic here in Brazil. The cooperative federalism enshrined in the federal constitution. The federal constitution, I have read them. So the tension, how, how can we, can we uh, show this tension? Uh, within the Brazilian uh, judicial architecture, the federal Supreme Court is the highest court uh, and that has the competence to discuss and judge cases related to the allocation of federal competence. So I chose two cases related to the federal competence and the, the health, public health care. And I will present briefly two uh, actions in the abstract uh, constitutional review. Firstly, during the early times, uh, we had the, 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 the conflict between the entities, the federal entities, Last year, on March 2020, uh, the health protection was an issue that reached the Supreme Court. 
So this first action, the direct unconstitutionality action, 6341, deals with how to exercise the competence to define essential activities during uh, the pandemic and the restriction measures related to the service. So uh, briefly, the rapporteur uh, of the case, just Marco Aurelio, issued a provisional order that recognizes the joint federal competence related to the right to health. So the third, therefore, the federal union, the states, the federal district, and also the municipalities are allowed to act administrative and legislate in the field of public health according to the local conditions. So the court ruled that all federal levels have the competence with the cooperative federalism in Brazil to adopt normative and administrative measures to face the COVID-19 pandemic. So I consider this case the most important one for defining the contours of the Brazilian Federation during the pandemic. Actually, it was the, the, the leading case, we can say, the leading case about the federalists and uh, the federalists during the COVID-19 outbreaks. And any conflict according to the court, must be resolved in light of the better protection of the right to health. And the second case I'd like to emphasize is related to the second phase of the pandemic here in Brazil. Actually, there were two actions, two direct actions uh, about the same problem. Once, uh, uh, once more, the court uh, uh, Considered the omission of the center, the, the federal union. So, uh, this case reached the Supreme Court in relation to the vaccination programs. The court ruled once more the common competence to take care of the health and then uh, uh, to authorize the states, the federal districts, and the municipalities to implement a spe specific vaccination programs, despite of the, the union, the omission, the inaction of the, the federal union. So the competence of the Ministry of Health to coordinate, so the, the cooperative federalism, the Ministry of Health has the competence to coordinate the, coordinate the national immunization program and define uh, the vaccines that are part of the national immunization calendar, but the other entities are authorized to establish the, the program and also to, uh, to buy vaccines. So, uh, as we can see, uh, this, the context of the pandemic, the context of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Brazil, uh, it show, demonstrates the, a real crisis, a real federative crisis within the Federalist Act to the Supreme Court, since the beginning, as I said, the first case that I related was from last year and this, the other one uh, nowadays this year. So the Supreme Court, since the beginning and still nowadays, has played the role of a federal constitutional court and has fixed the constitutional exegesis of the Brazilian cooperative federalism conception with a focus on consolidating a greater balance uh, between the federal entities. So the debates over federalism here in Brazil outline the tension, the tension between the constitutional rhetoric and the political reality of the federalism. The court reinforced the cooperative framework provided by the Constitution with the federalist competence and recognizes the need for respect uh, of this competence without subordination between each level, each uh, legal order, we can say. So this reinforcement of the cooperative federalism is a kind of a judicial decision-making strategy for guaranteeing the implementation of public policy to face the coronavirus pandemic in a continental country like Brazil. So the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the dynamic in the federal relations in Brazil. And we in short, we can, we can conclude that despite the political crisis, the cooperative federalism was 
judicially reinforced in Brazil, and this development is particularly significant and important to protect and promote the right to health in the country. This is my contribution to the event. Thank you once more for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Manuelita, for your explanation. It was a very important um, debate here in Brazil about the federalism and the pandemic uh, protection. Um, I would like to, uh, if you, if is there, is there, is there any question, please, Professor Neandro, Professor Itogu Gulino, would like you to ask some questions, Professor Saulo, to our panelists our speakers. Professor Dani. Oh yes, please, Professor Iron. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask to Professors Manuelita and Carolina, please, if you, what can you say about this, the federalism? and including the environmental or animals, right? What can we say about, uh, about uh, the recent news? Let me say something about the, the human rights of vaccine and the danger. Sorry about my, uh, I am an economist, sorry about, but the recent danger of recontagions between animals and, uh, uh, that's my animal, <laughs> about the, the, the recent uh, dangers of human versus animals and if he, there are and there is there are some uh, um, how can I say some laws some rights uh, that are being talking in Brazil or, or abroad. Sorry, I'll be to my dog is. Thank you, Professor. Uh, please, Professor Carolina. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It seems that the Daniel's dog was uh, trying to ask a question too. <laughs> um, I don't know if I could, if I understood the question, but but I think it has to do with the possible with the the recent informations that speaks about the possibility that COVID uh, mutations go past between humans and other species of animals. It's, it's that so? Something like that. Something between this, something like this, and if in Brazil, if in your country or abroad, and in, in prof uh, professor, uh, to if in Brazil there is something related to this, I believe not, but I'm just an economist. Okay, no, I, I think it, it it is very clear with the with this situation of the pandemic. I, I am not a scientist. I'm just a if it's possible to say a scientist of law and philosophy, but uh, many say that it's not science. Um, but it's difficult to say first, if that it's the, really the case. There have been cases in which has been uh, found uh, COVID or traces of COVID in animals, like in Den Denmark that were killed, a lot of uh, animals that were kept uh, in jails for uh, in cages for uh, the producing of fur, for, for to make a, uh, close. They were killed, thousands of animals were killed and in other countries have been found in uh, in animals that, especially animals that are kept, kept in cautivity. And that shows and shows the same thing that has been shown from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the, real, the close relation of humans with animals that are used or uh, um, kept for human purposes uh, provokes this possible this possible uh, exchanges it seems um, in, in the case of China if that it's so because I think it's not totally 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 clear that it, if it was a bat or it was a pangolin or a, or another animal it was the the 
the the use of these animals by humans that provokes and develops this this situation and the the other animals in souls are in uh, factories of fur in this case are getting sick because of the this close relationship and i think thank you i i don't know sorry and thank you professor uh, let's 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 go to listen professor manuelita hermes yeah. okay uh, we'd like to talk about this, this subject, Professor Manarita. Okay, just a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Daniele, for the question. Actually, uh, reading the com comparative federalism, the environmental law is an issue also because uh, we are talking about shared competence. So each, each, entity, each federal entity can rule about it, about the environmental law accordingly to the local conditions. So it's a, a, a specifically the animal rights are not in the Supreme Court uh, specifically, but they are considered within the environmental law as an issue because, uh, for example, we have two, two cases related to uh, for, uh, uh, emissions and, and uh, financial to the climate, for example, the climate fund and the Amazon fund. And judging uh, uh, these cases, uh, analyzing these cases, the Federal Supreme Court recognized the interdependence of rights. So not only the fund, not only the climate, not only the Amazon, but, but all the other rights and uh, also the animal rights. So we have uh, in the Federal Supreme Court this, this comprising uh, analysis uh, about the, the issue, the animal issue, and also considering the interdependence of rights. I don't know if I answered your question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Manolita. Uh, I, I would like to, um, to ask you to Professor Kennedy, Professor Fadwa, and Professor Janich. Um, in here in Brazil, we face uh, a lot of problems about the debate and, and ideological division, divide, and a lot of um, political problems to face this pandemic. So we are the, the second one country in the world with almost 4,000 um, four, uh, and millions of uh, uh, people died. And in the world, you have more than three trillions, three, three billions of, of people um, died. Uh, 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 three millions, three millions of people died. Sorry, and and the United States have a, a very big, the biggest GDP around the world, twenty trillions of dollars. Brazil is just one. To them. Um, why, Professor? Uh, how about the, 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 the implementation and the protection against COVID in your country and, and, and the relationship between this problem and the political problem in Egypt and Chile and United States? And Professor Fadra, please, first, could you talk about this? I don't know if you live in Egypt or United States, but I think you. I live in the United States and uh, I'm frequently in Egypt. It's my uh, country of birth. Um, the, I think that we, you are right. We need to look at the patterns and we need to look at the underlying causes, which were alluded to by uh, Professor Kenneth in, in, in terms of the um, the uh, uh, faults that were unmasked in society, a racism that was covered up and uh, with political uh, correct rhetoric and so on. But we also need to look at early patterns that we might forget for insights because when COVID began, it hit the most prosperous, the most industrial, uh, northern Euro 
European nations. It was Northern Italy, it was France, it was Germany, it was Austria that were the most hit when the rest of the world was just watching. And I think this is very important insight, even though COVID being that it's programmed naturally to survive and to transmit across borders and so on, succeeded in going elsewhere, it is important to, um, to uh, focus on why this particular region uh, had such high, intense um, um, infection rate. Uh, while, uh, as I said, we are the most industrialized, most prosperous, and most prepared in terms of health institutions. The stereotype was, oh, uh, when the COVID was discovered in China, uh, they started saying, oh, we have to be careful it was spread in Africa. In fact, Africa is doing very well, except for South Africa, by comparison. And if we look at Egypt, the rates have always been low and they continue to be low and they never had a lockdown and they have a highly dense population of over 100 million. So in other words, we still don't understand everything, but we do know that there, what was unmasked, not caused by, but unmasked, the inequalities, the uh, racism, the lack of say, uh, well, we are telling them to wash their hands, but they don't have running water. And of course, uh, this is the United States of America, when its um, uh, population uh, of the original inhabitants don't have services. And even, I think Kenneth mentioned uh, vaccines. With the vaccines now, you find another aspect is not just access to vaccine, but the kind of access to vaccine. Uh, you find uh, reports of um, the people who, who cannot afford, uh, unprivileged people who cannot afford to go to a doctor, um, are told, go and get your vaccine without knowing that this person just had COVID and they have terrible reactions and they are dying. In other words, they are not getting the right services and the right medical treatment because of these uh, poor services and poor access. But we do want to raise the question, why was the prosperous white North the first to be hit so hard? And it looked for a while that it will never leave Northern Europe. And then it started moving. Uh, the United States was also shocked because people, again, it's stereotypical. The United States is prosperous, the United States is powerful, it can. Uh, enforce sanctions on any country, and uh, here we are, it fell apart. Why? Not because COVID caused it to fall apart. COVID unmasked the fact that it was already fallen apart and needed to, uh, to be highlighted. And in Egypt, we want to know if you say it is hot weather, cold weather, uh, high density population, uh, the people did not really uh, follow uh, the rules as strictly as the America in California, for instance, and they never had lockdowns. But the rates are so low by comparison with the rest of the world, we want to know why. We're not really saying, uh, putting a hierarchy of good, bad, and indifferent. I think as a scientist, from my perspective, uh, I'd like to know the uh, dynamics behind such patterns. We still don't have the right studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fadwa. And Professor Janiti, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, um, there are a couple of things that I'd like to discuss. The first one is that uh, the, we are far from the epidemic being over. So my hypothesis would be that there are countries that haven't been affected yet but they will be affected. I mean, in India, they were saying exactly the same that than Fadwa is saying, and look what is happening now. So this is an issue that is probably most related to the way that the virus translates more than the issues of different susceptibilities. Now, one thing respect to policy, 
that there had been two type of responses and therefore a uh, 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 level of people um, um, affected. The first one, of course, is that those countries that have had the recent experiences on, 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 on outbreaks that had been devastating have done much better. And the example is the people in Africa uh, that, that had the Ebola epidemic, and then people in Asia that have had the, the SARS epidemic. And those countries, those people were the first to Im immediately implement a zero COVID policy instead of mitigation. So they locked down or they they closed their frontiers. They they implemented a very strict uh, trace uh, isolation and testing uh, strategy and so on. Now, uh, of course, we don't know yet uh, all the issues related to COVID. Uh, we have been discussing why some countries are more affected than others, but. For the sake of the of the of what of the reality now, I think that the what is important is to understand that and until we are all safe, nobody is safe, and we want this epidemic won't be over until uh, probably perhaps a couple of years. Now, regarding the response of countries, I mean there are countries that had been uh, extremely. I mean their leaders have been extremely. Uh, uh, irresponsible in their responses and that has caused a lot of death and suffering and those uh, leaders uh, I mean we all know that the Trump leadership in the in the US and of course the bolsonaro leadership in Brazil has been sort of examples on on how not to lead uh, um, uh, the response uh, um, now uh, Having said that, in most of the countries of the world, the response has been far from optimum. And uh, now we are seeing that the response related to vaccination is, is far from optimal. And the, the, the extent of vaccination is very, is very bad. And of course, again, not only in the, in the appearance, but also in the response to COVID, what you can see is that the inequities, the social inequities and access inequities are perpetrating. Even when you look at what the global agencies are doing, you see that at the end of the day, they are all trying to come up with the novel ideas, but without really looking at what is the global system that needs to be put in place. And so they are like 1,000 committees, commissions, task force, and so on, but uh, adding to the fragmentation. But until now, still not a unified response. There was a report last week, released last week, of the independent panel that basically assessed the response of WHO and others. And the, the, the report is, is devastating. And the recommend, I mean, but that, okay, that's fine. Our time is over. Sorry, Professor. And Professor Kenneth, please. Yeah, um, so um, as Professor uh, Gwendy uh, indicated, um, the um, COVID basically exposed the racism, took the scab off of the racism uh, in the United States. And uh, there's a saying, they said, uh, when uh, white people get a cold, black people get the flu. And it's always worse, whenever there's a problem, it's always worse with uh, black people. And then uh, we also had, during COVID, we had the George Floyd situation, which really exposed the racism in uh, the United States. So at least now we can no longer pretend like, you know, after Obama was elected, there was all this conversation about the United States being post-racial and we were beyond a race. And now we know that is no, with Trump and COVID, George Floyd, the continued shooting of black people, black men especially, uh, by the police, that we're not nowhere close to uh, post-racial. Uh, and as the article that I showed you pointed out, is America a racist country? It shouldn't even be a controversial answer. The answer is clearly yes. Uh, and uh, he pointed out that um, it's not the overt racism, it's the structural racism that has been put into place. Structural racism means that um, basically you have laws that put into place structures that has, created a racism. 
and I gave you some examples of that. And that has carried over to uh, COVID. And we're going to have problems in the future. Pandemics are other problems in the future that will be disproportionately borne by uh, people of color and uh, Black people. You know, it's been with every single uh, situation like that. HIV, I remember, and still to this day, disproportionately, who gets HIV? Well, Black people, OK, um, and Latino uh, people. So it's just a continuing uh, pattern. But at least now it's been exposed and hopefully we can uh, continue to address these uh, issues. And at least now we have a president who is not exploiting those racial, the, that racial uh, resentment. We no longer have that. The problem is for four years, we had a president who was exploiting racial resentment and promoting it for his own uh, ends. So uh, one okay. other thing I had is uh, yesterday, just yesterday, our Center for Disease Control, you probably heard this, um, we don't have to wear masks anymore. But we Thank still have 40% so of the country that's still not vaccinated. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Uh, and our time is over, the panel is over. And I ask Professor Gurgulino, or Professor Leandro, Professor Saulo, if you have some question, or if you can finish this seminar. Professor Gugolino, I would like you to ask some words to our audience to, to end our event, please. Hear me? Turn on. Okay, I can hear you. We can hear you. Turn on the, the, the microphone, please. One more time. Okay. 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 Now? Okay. 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 So, okay. okay. I'm supposed to, to, to finalize this program, but I'm, I'm sure I don't have much time. Frankly speaking, I will. Uh, I will have to take a much longer time than we have available, and and then I would like to also see the papers which the participants have sent to the Secretariat, but unfortunately I don't have access to those papers. I took notes, I have here in my hands, uh, about 20 pages, I cannot read them, it's too long. But I would like to, to, to mention some important points. I would say this meeting was important to look from Latin American point of view, but also look at global issues. And then hopefully we could see more of what should happen in Latin America. Once we heard this the very nice presentation that we, we had this morning and the last two days. Frankly speaking, Latin America is a special region, as we know. I think we should follow this seminar by another one later, examining the conclusions of this seminar and see what should we do, what action should we do to correct the issues which are affecting Latin America. I just want to mention one thing. Education was important, was mentioned as a fundamental issue here. Okay, I think of my country, Brazil, as you all know, we have a problem of illiteracy, people that cannot read and write. Why, where can we train them in schools? Yes, in the educational system, but not in the regular schools. The regular schools don't teach that. So, but we could easily do that. When I was rector on the Federal University of San Carlos in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I asked my teachers and education department if they could set up a training program for the literacy in the campus. We found about 15 people who do not read and write in our own university. So we organized a training program in the evenings. We paid the teachers, we provide them transportation as possible, and they were training. And finally, at the end of the training, all of those 15 people finally could read and write. So if all the schools in this country, I would say every high education institution in Brazil, there are more than a thousand of them, they could organize training programs to help people read and write. Okay, the other issue we spoke about was quality of teaching of teachers for elementary schools. 
That's important. We should improve the quality of the teaching. Okay, this could be examples. I'm just giving you, I was supposed to give some words, some speech, words in this occasion, the first try. And then I decided, okay, I better not do that. Now. Let's, let's have my colleagues to identify what are the issues we should be doing. So I would say this, I start just with, with, with comments. When Gary Jacobs made his pre initial presentation and how he, he, he told us the important meetings which are really important for the future. The first thing, the first issue he mentioned is education. New education. A new education meaning a different education than the ones we had before the pandemic. How can we do that? So fundamentally, we have to think uh, how can we train the teachers, that's number one, to have good quality of teaching. Second, as you probably know, some people mentioned, in some countries of Latin America right now, there will be elections coming up. And what can we learn from that? These elections, in fact, happened already in the United States. Mr. Trump left, Mr. Von Biden came, and he has a different view. He thinks that the famous conference in Paris needs special attention because of the environmental issues. Fundamentally, this will be affecting the whole world, not only Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe, etc. So we have to think of the issues which are coming. We have to think of education for the future. What means for the future? People say we don't know the future. Yes, but we, we know what the future will begin to show. For instance, education itself, instead of being just traditional face-to-face -face teacher and students, we have now online education. And this has grown and is still growing and it will grow more in the future. So we have to think of these issues, I said. We have to consider that the world we need to change its fuels. We have to forget about fossil fuels. We should think of energy, renewable fossil fuels. This is fundamental for the country. That's one, another issue that Gary Gapers mentioned. And so that we should be look, looking at this. The, Gary mentioned that we tried, as the World Academy of Arts and Science, together with the UN in Geneva, to look at the issues for the global leadership for the 21st century. That's a fundamental issue. We still have a lot to do on that. This will be Latin America and other parts of the world, clearly. But we have to consider that. We have to fight, think of security. What we mean by pandemic effects in human security, and human security fundamentally, saves lives. We have to save millions of lives. Okay, so I would say we, we could add other issues to the points that uh, my friend Gary Jacobs raised. But uh, I think we've had fantastic meetings and presentations today. First of all, I want to thank the coordinators, the moderators of this session for their valuable assistance. We have to also consider thanking all the participants for their speeches. And hopefully, if they have sent the papers, we should put them together and hopefully come up with a publication. It will be important for the World Academy to have this publication. I want to thank particularly the organizing committee of this meeting. I want to thank particularly the fellows which are here, the organizing committee. I want to thank Daniele. I want to thank Saulo Casali Bahia. Neanto Saveda Rivano, Eron Godilho, Joanilho, Rodolfo, and Gira. First of all, I want to thank also the, the people that are working in India in cooperation with us, who made possible that we could have this presentation as we have today here with the different participants. <clears throat> That's also very important. And I want to thank them. They worked a lot, and we have many hours of work which is important. So I would say I would love to do a detailed presentation, but I don't think we have the time. So uh, we will do it later, papers, say the papers to all of you. And, and also after we've received the papers, 
and he should be with the secretary. So I used to be president of the World Academy of Arts and Science and of the World University of Minnesota. Unfortunately, I had to leave because you know, when you're getting a little bit older, I became in my 18, 19, 92, and I'll be 93 in one year, one month and a half. So I think it's time for me to devote some time to major issues, looking at what you have been doing and prescribing for all of us, and particularly if you think of education, this is an area in which I have worked for 68 years. So I've, I, I love to hear what I heard today from the colleagues. So I want to thank you again. Wonderful, fantastic. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your conduct this afternoon. Thank you, Leandro, and thank you, Saulo, particularly, Casale, by here. Thanks to Zuvadva, thanks for to uh, Luciana and Luci Hermes, and also thank you to the, those that today made nice presentations. It came from other countries outside Brazil. We should also try to publish this to distribute to our colleagues in Latin America. Latin America is a great region in the world, but it's particularly, I know in the area of education, it needs a lot of work, a lot of work, many, many hours, really, and, and unless we do it urgently, we will have problems in the near future. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I better stop here because I already closed my time, and I would hope to contact you by email, and I will send you the publication of the, this particular meeting when, as soon as we get all the papers ready. Thank you very much.